1916 saw the birth of the Pikes Peak Climb. Its course, this hairpin road, snaking in 12 and a half almost perpendicular miles, 5,000 feet up the side of the mountain. Its purpose, to test not only a car's speed, but of more importance, its endurance. For it was the automobile's ever-increasing dependability that was rapidly putting the nation on wheels. or bust. Here's the entrance to the long road up Pikes Peak, Colorado, where thousands are thrilled yearly by a 12-mile race that takes the starch and heart out of everybody but a champion. There's the start, 12 miles of grueling, skidding, heartbreaking climb. No smooth, wide tracks, no bank curves here. You take that dust and dirt and bumps and hairpin twist as they come, if you can. If not, you're liable to crash a few hundred feet down to a very dry Davy Jones lock. All cars are champion equipped. Here again, a champion with champion is stops at the top. Colorado, with motors wide open, racing cars whirl around the winding mountain roads in a cloud of dust, competing for the Pikes Peak Trophy. Every entry must have nerves of steel to climb the hazardous course, skidding around dangerous hairpin curves at the risk of their lives. It's a supreme test of skill, with sharp turns all along the way. Climbing 5,000 feet in a distance of 12 miles, they have to do almost a mile a minute, slowing up just enough on the curves to avoid a crash. This year's race was won by crossing the finish line in 17 minutes and 40 seconds.
Pikes Peak, Colorado, it's the annual mountain race on a course that ties itself in knots every few hundred yards. Pikes Peak is a mile high from base to summit, but by the time they've twisted round and round the mountain, competing cars have covered more than 10 miles. And for thousands of spectators, it's dust in your eyes. And as they go higher and higher, say a little prayer, they won't skid over the edge. And here comes the leader, Louis Ansa, so duck down. And Ansa breaks all records to be first man on top of the world. Not only has man conquered this historic mountain, but he ascends it at speeds of 70 miles an hour in the annual Pikes Peak Hill Climb. Both man and machine must be in top shape if they expect to see the summit. With a wave of the starter's flag, the official pace car, a 320 horsepower DeSoto, starts the 12 and a half mile upward grind. There are skids and spills aplenty on the 165 curves and torturous turns that dot the way up the 14,000 foot course. The racers start at three minute intervals. Bob Finney of Colorado Springs gets the flag and blazes away in the fight against the clock. Finney is the defending champion in this 34th annual classic and his high-powered car taking the dangerous turns at fantastic speeds. Roaring down the straightaway and getting the starter's flag is fireball Bobby Unser of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Unser possesses a lead foot and is barreling around the treacherous curves at blinding speed. Bobby Unser guns his motor all the way and negotiates the 12 and a half mile incline in 14 minutes 27 seconds for a new all-time Pike Peak hill climb record. Fifty-two of the highest mountains in the country are in Colorado. Though Pikes Peak is not quite the highest of all, by a few feet only, it is surely the most famous of all America's sky-brushing mountains. It rises 14,110 feet above sea level, a mile and a half above the plain at its foot. Each year, more than a quarter of a million tourists climb the mountain, either driving over the marvelously engineered automobile highway to the top or on the Cog Railway. And as our train climbs steadily up and up toward the distant clouds, a changing panorama of awe-inspiring beauty passed our window. As we neared an elevation of 12,000 feet, we reached the timber line, that invisible mark drawn by nature above which no trees can grow. Here we could almost reach out and touch the clouds, for we had chosen to come here on Labor Day to watch the famous Pikes Peak Hill Climb, the most grueling auto race in the country. Each year, the nation's top race drivers compete in a race against time up the twisting auto rows for a racetrack. And as we stood on top of the mountain and watched, it was a double thrill to know that at last we too had finally realized the dream those early pioneers had expressed so simply on the canvas of their wagons, Pike's Peak or Bust. In any speed contest, such as this road race, time is at a premium. For example, a man can't exactly loaf when a tire has to be changed. However, there's always a good chance of making up for lost time when a thousand or more miles remain to be covered. Not in this race, however. This is the race that's different from other big time events because there's practically no margin for error. The racer gets underway in the event for championship class cars. This is a one at a time event with the cars leaving at safely spaced intervals. With less than 13 miles to go, the pressure is on right from the start to make every second count. Not long after his flying start, a driver hits the first of many curves. 152 of them, in fact, some requiring a 146-degree turn. 
The narrow, slippery gravel road is another driving handicap. Makes it easy to lose ground and time because of poor traction. In addition, practically every foot of this course is uphill. The average grade is 7%, but many grades exceed 10%. And in climbing nearly a full mile skyward, the temperature can drop as much as 50 degrees from the starting line to the finish. The higher you go, the thinner the air becomes too, making it more difficult for engines to breathe properly for full power acceleration. Every part of the course has its share of spectators, checking off each car that passes, and sympathizing with the drivers of cars that don't make the grade. But attention quickly shifts back again to cars still in the running, especially as they climb closer to the finish line. Unofficial reports indicate that the times are faster than last year's record-breaking climb to the clouds. All in all, 29 of the country's top racing drivers took a crack at the course in the championship class cars. Bob Finney, 14 minutes, 11 and 7 tenths seconds. Second was Slim Roberts in a car owned by Dick Frenzel, who also built the winning car. Third place went to Bobby Hunzer. The winners of the first three places all broke the previous record. Back at the start line, Act Miller points the way to the top. He's been there before six times as a winner in the unlimited sports car division. Events like the Bonneville Nationals, the Pan American Pro Race, and the world famous Mini Amelia all lie in Act Miller's racing background. But at Pike's Peak, he has consistently found the secret of the winning combination. It's a new record. Now Bobby Unser prepares for his ride as fast as qualifier. He leads off the championship division in search of his eighth win. The best way to study the technique of a winner is to ride with him, watching over his shoulder as he climbs Unser's mountain.
temper line, but higher up, the barren cliffs can unnerve the driver. Concentration is the winning secret here, and timing, split-second timing on the narrow switchback. The records tumble. Bobby Unser wins the championship division of the Race to the Cloud. Expert drivers like Mario Andretti must learn to respect the mountain. On his first try, he talks to the men who know the road best, then draws some interesting conclusions. Well, uh, I've raced uh, almost everywhere. I have raced on different type of tracks, uh, from uh, ovals to uh, road courses and so forth. And uh, uh, I just found out this trip that uh, the hill is pretty rough. This 14-mile course is still as dangerous and as much of a challenge to racing driver Rick Mears. Now, he and his brother Roger have been daring the tight turns and sheer drops of the Pikes Peak Hill climb since 1972. It's also a family tradition for young Bobby Unser Jr. The Unsers have been putting this one away for the last eight years. Louis Unser builds engines. His machines have been some of the fastest on the mountain. Bobby Unser is here today in the unfamiliar role of spectator, along with Parnelli Jones. Rick Mears and Peter Firestone check out Rick's tires. They've taken sprint tires and regrouped them so the tread can cut through the loose gravel to grab onto solid ground and find traction. There goes Bobby Unser Jr. He looks like he's making pretty good time as we watch him go. The family follows his progress. He's in a curve. His tail is moving a little sideways going out of those curves. Apparently the road's a little loose. He's skating just a little bit. Bobby Jr.'s time, 12 minutes, 52 seconds. Something for Rick Mears to beat. That and 14 miles of switchback road, 156 turns, and a climb of 9,392 feet. your enemy. First it's behind you, then it owns your windshield on a snaky left-hander. Now for a hard right-hander. Come in at 100 miles an hour, stand on the brake, throw your car sideways. and flat out through the S's. Now for a blue sky turn. Nothing for markers, but blue sky. speech Rick turns his wheel right to go left and left to go right. The racers call this opposite lock. In the dirt it's all opposite lock. thousand feet down. A lot less if you're lucky. After eight 
years of Unser domination, today there's a new winner. Rick Mears puts Bobby Unser in second place by over 40 seconds. Rally championships in the record book, the Quattro turned toward America. The target, the Pike Peak Hill Climb, an event dominated by single-purpose, single-seat sprinters with rear-wheel drive. The Audi four-wheel drive is very, very important because when you have a lot of horsepower, you need to get the horsepower to the ground. And you'll see as the as the open-wheel cars and even the stock cars, when they start, they spin their wheels furiously. Uh, and this is very exciting, but it doesn't get you to the top as fast. 1985, French rally champion Michel Mouton drives a quattro to overall victory at Pikes Peak, trouncing over 60 conventional machines in the process. You are always sliding one side, the other side is like a ballet, it's like a dance, you know, it's, it's fantastic. go to bed at night and I used to just dream when I was 10 years old of winning Pikes Peak, of becoming the so-called king of the hill. But there's one small problem. The reigning king of the hill is in fact a French woman, Michelle Mouton, who last year raced her all-wheel drive Audi Quattro to a new Pikes Peak record, an achievement that didn't go unnoticed by Bobby Unser. I just really couldn't see some French girl, and I'm not knocking the French people, but I just couldn't see a French girl having the Pikes Peak record. The Challenge of the Hill has held a unique attraction for the greatest drivers in the world. One family, however, has dominated the event since its earliest days, the Unser family. Pikes Peak and the Unser started before I was born. My father raced up here and, and he had two brothers, my two uncles, that was Joe Unser and Uncle Louie, and all three of them were racing up here together at the same time. In fact, my father and my two uncles put the first motorcycle and sidecar in history on top of Pikes Peak. And that's before that there was a road belt up there. So that was kind of a unique new thing. And then uh, all of them started racing up here, and I don't remember what year, but it would have been before I was born, somewhere in the 1920s. And my father always built his own car and ran that. My Uncle Joe switched back and forth, building his own car and driving for other people. And my Uncle Louie, who ended up winning the race nine times, he usually drove for other people, very seldom for himself. Well, my dad had four boys, and we came along and decided that Pikes Peak was our thing. When Michelle Mouton came up uh, last year, year 1985, uh, I looked at the car and I watched her run. She did a very good job in her driving. The car was very, very, very much ahead of anything that I'd ever seen before. Audi has done an awful, awful lot of work on all-wheel drive, and I saw things that just astounded me. 
And I started uh, doing a lot of thinking, a lot of talking, a lot of studying, trying to see the best way to come back and get the record back in the answer knee. Behind the wheel of the Audi Quattro, Bobby Unser, at age 52, with a once-in-a-lifetime chance to regain his title, King of the Hill. Once again, someone named Unser was the winner here. But this time, the odds were clearly against that happening. 21-year-old Robbie Unser is long on talent, but short on experience. In two previous races here, Robbie was a winner each time. But this year, he graduated to a Peugeot 405, the fastest car in the history of Pikes Peak Racing. He was the first to admit the car was faster than he was. And on top of that, Robbie is still driving with a cast on his foot, a reminder of a bad sprint car crash two years ago. Still, he patiently got acquainted with the quirky all-wheel drive, four-wheel steer Peugeot. By race day, his times were respectable with his teammate, Ari Vatanen, the hill record holder. Everyone expected Vatanen to win again and smash the course record. Instead, he smashed a rock. That popped a tire and handed the victory to Robbie. Three victories and three tries is a feat even his famous father, Bobby, can't beat. It rises over 14,000 feet into the air. Its name is Pikes Peak. And for 71 years, man and machine have challenged the mountain to see which is best. Sometimes it's man, sometimes it's the mountain. 
The line between success and failure is as thin as the air, and the price you pay for crossing the line can be the most frightening moment ever experienced by a racer. Since 1988, the overall record has been 10 minutes, 47.22 seconds. Last year, Robbie Unser came close, winning his fifth division crown, but missing the magical mark, which has become the holy grail of the hill climb. The evolution of technology here at Pikes Peak over the last 71 years is incredible. Turbocharger systems, fuel injection, two-wheel drive, four-wheel drive, wings. They even have cars specifically built for Pikes Peak. The largest gains have been in the area of wings. Some of the teams have wings large enough to produce a thousand pounds of downforce at 50 miles an hour. In the past, drivers have been able to change their air-fuel mixture as they go up the hill. The problem with this? They're too busy. It normally doesn't happen. The solution? A computerized fuel management system. This system analyzes atmospheric conditions 32,000 times a second and makes the adjustment. That's right, 32,000 times a second. The one factor no one can control is the weather. We're here at the 10 mile marker and it's beautiful. Let's check in with the third member of our team, Bart Kendall. He's seven miles further up the course. Well, thank you, Spencer. I'm about three miles from the summit at a place they call the Bottomless Pit. More on that name in a moment. Well, I think weather is going to play a major factor in the outcome of this race for a couple of reasons. First, it's extremely windy in the upper sections of the track with gusts of winds moving up to 50 miles an hour. This is really going to move the cars around as they go through the higher speed sections of the course, especially those open wheel cars with the big front and rear wings. Secondly, the extremely dry weather conditions we've had over the last several days, combined with the calcium chloride that's been laid down on the track to eliminate the dust, has made the track lightning fast. We had several track records during qualifying, and there's actually a rubber groove laid down on the track that has it behaving more like asphalt than on dirt. So what does this mean with the wind gusts and the higher speeds? Well, the danger level is definitely higher this year. And if you look off to my left, a mistake right here, and it's a long way down to Manatee Springs and civilization. Now you know why they call this the bottomless pit. I tell you, it's something else just to, for all three of us being the same race. It's really something, a lot of fun. I've raced with my sons all the time, so that, that wasn't no big deal, but then to be able to come back and be with a grandson is really special. Well, the thought of being dad and grandpa was certainly on his mind, and he was just really realizing what three generations meant. I, I'm looking so forward to seeing my grandfather get up this hill, and he's having such a good time. His Dodge T300 is just running great, and uh, um, I just hope everything turns out right. We get up to the top, and we have a lot of celebrating to do. Well, then it was Roger Sr.'s turn, and of course, he was uh, stuck in the middle. Did he give away all his secrets to his son? Did he get all the secrets from Dad? This was really interesting as the Mears gang was doing battle in showroom stock. Well, remember, these are totally showroom stock trucks, so they appear to be going very slow, but they're going as fast as those trucks are capable of going, and that's a steep hill. Just adding the roll cage and the rest of it was showroom stock. For Roger, a memorable moment. And uh, my dad, the guy that started this whole thing and taught me everything I know about racing uh, in front of me, and then... Uh, my son behind me that I passed everything on to him, almost everything. Uh, just like my dad, obviously, because he's running faster than I am, uh, didn't pass on everything either. So the tricks of the family will stay within the family and not all of them will be shared, obviously, but as we get up towards the peak, the power drain on these vehicles, as we see the time for Bill Mears Sr. at 15 minutes, 17.4 seconds. And here is Junior still working his way and close to the edge. What a great shot that is, just looking out into space. I don't care if you're 64 years old or 22 years old, it's got to be a rush. So he makes the corner and luckily does not take us over the edge. Thank you, <laughs> Mr. Junior. Appreciate that very much. And as we work our way to the top of the mountain, Mears Sr. is not, he's going to get dusted by his dad. Oh, but he kept, he held back. He held back. <laughs> he didn't show him everything. Well, what about Mears Jr.? Could he beat Grandpa? Oh, no way. He's going to beat Father Roger Sr., but he's going to cross the finish line in a time of 15 minutes, 38.5 seconds. So Bill Mears Sr. at age 64 takes home the trophy. Speaking of son Roger, he drove at the Indy 500 with Rick Mears, as did all these others, as well as driving here at Pikes Peak. That's a pretty select crowd to be in. 
we will not go to the top of the mountain today. We'll fall three miles short of the 14,110 feet. The weather has been just abysmal for six days straight. I know what you're saying. Down here at the starting line, sunshine. It's kind of nice. Why are we racing up top? Well, let's go to my partner, Bart Kendall, where he can explain it best. Way up there. Well, Marty, I've made it down from the summit here at Devil's Playground at 16 Mile, and boy, what a ride it was. It was scary for me. And the reason they moved this race, or the finish of this race down here, see the finish right behind me. The road conditions a little better here, but when I was driving down, there was ice, my tires were locking up, I was white knuckling it, and it was scary for me. I tell you, just in a rental car going 15, 20 miles an hour, these drivers might be brave, they might be courageous, but they're not stupid. We'll finish it right here this year. Let's show you the race course. It starts all the way down at 9,390 feet. And Bart, take us all the way up from there. Well, as they race away from the starting line, they'll be racing in mainly tree-lined areas. You'll see that first thing, they'll come by the checkpoint we refer to as the ski area. Then they'll go up in the next checkpoint we commonly refer to as Glen Cove. After that, it's up to the W's where they switch back and forth. And there you see Devil's Playground, where we will finish the race this year. But as you move past Devil's Playground on the map, you see you go all the way up to the top of the mountain over the back side at 14,110 feet, which is normally the finish of this race. Speaking of bad weather, this is the first day of practice. That is Robbie Unser in his super stock truck. Hey, you see what they do, the officials do, is they divide practice up into three different sections. You never run the whole race course until race day. So here on this day with the rain and the fog and the mud, they're just going on one portion of the racetrack. So when they go to the second day, they're not quite sure what track conditions to expect. Here we are still on the first day. It's, you can see conditions are just awful. Now this was day two. Everybody woke up to a snowstorm. Doesn't it snow where you are in the late days of June? Well, the top section of the course was closed. This was the mid portion at Glen Cove and only four cars made it up before they shut down practice altogether. When it came for day three of practice, there was more snow. In fact, blizzard conditions, 28 degree temperatures, 50 mile an hour winds. It shut down the top portion of the race course again. And for the first time in 73 years, we will not race to the summit of Pikes Peak. Now, you've been around the peak for a while. Have you ever seen a week as wild as this one? No, no. We're breaking all kinds of records this week and it wasn't against the clock. <laughs> In 1997, Herzog Motorsports entered the famed event for the first time with two vehicles. The first entry was a unique electric-powered Chevy S10 truck driven by Larry Ragland. This quiet yet quick vehicle shattered all existing records for its class in its first ever appearance. In 1998, Herzog Motorsports returned to the hill with a redesigned all-wheel drive truck and veteran Baja off-road racer Larry Ragland at the wheel. Ragland piloted the powerful Chevy truck up the hill, winning the highly competitive super stock truck class in only Herzog's second attempt. Larry is ready. And he's off, up the famed Pikes Peak course with its 156 turns along the nearly 12 and one half mile climb. Larry Ragland has won the 1999 Pikes Peak International Hill Climb once again with a time of 11 minutes, 24 and 36 hundredths of a second. It's a great drama of a race because of this long history. It was all dirt up until just a few years ago. A couple of years it was both dirt and pavement. Now it's all pavement. The pavement has raised the speeds a lot. It actually raises the risk. Even though you'd think it's easier to drive on pavement, the downside is if anything goes wrong, you're going a lot faster. The pressure, the crowds, the road looks really different on race day because of all the people. And they line up right on the edge of the road. It's 14 miles long, so there are not grandstands, there are not walls, there are not much in the way of fences. 
Drivers really have a responsibility to stay in control. It's another aspect of Pikes Peak. You've got to go fast, but you've got to stay in control.
30 seconds faster that we lost 50% of the power before halfway. I just lost a motor pack in the back. Um, first time doing a full run, you're going to learn some things. New record, but only by a second. 